Hello, everyone. It's March 22nd, and welcome to the fourth episode of Capital Markets Live. I am John Getches, Senior Vice President of Capital Markets at Ginny May, and today I am joined by Jay Bray, Chairman and CEO of Mr. Cooper, the third largest mortgage loan servicer in the country. Jay has been with Mr. Cooper since 2000 and has served in various leadership roles since joining the organization. For context, Mr. Cooper is a mega issuer of Ginny May MBS, ranking fifth in issuances, having issued more than $26 billion in Ginny May securities last year. Mr. Cooper ranks fourth in Ginny May MSRs at almost $90 billion and is also an approved reverse mortgage servicer and issuer for HMBS with over $5 billion in MSRs. Today's topic. In this episode, we will continue to explore trends of Ginny May's large portfolio of delinquent loans. At January month then, Ginny May's single family portfolio has 9.5% delinquency, consisting of approximately 1 million loans, totaling approximately $190 billion of loan balances. Jay, in the next few days, it will be the one year anniversary since the CARES Act was implemented to assist those households affected by the pandemic. What were your immediate challenges in this pandemic environment in this first year? Well, John, it's it's great to be with you today. You know, I'd say the immediate challenges with this response were really the unknowns of how many customers would be impacted and, you know, what the take-up rate for forbearance programs, which had never been offered historically, would be. We also really didn't know what the Fed was going to do to react. And that uncertainty was reflected in stock prices of every public mortgage company and REIT. You know, fortunately, we, we didn't panic. We developed a plan and we spent most of the early days of the pandemic prioritizing the health and safety of our team members and transitioning them to work from home before very quickly turning our attention to our customers and ensuring our customer service agents and our digital tools were positioned to handle all of the forbearance requests that we knew were coming. In fact, we had forbearance requests available on our website even before the CARES Act even passed. And once we had moved our team members to remote work and ensured our customers were able to get the help they needed, we then shifted our focus to the potential liquidity needs of the company. Really, without knowing the number of customers who would request forbearance, we needed a plan for liquidity for you know rates up to 30%. That was the one, the stress test that, that we ran was up to a 30% rate. Ultimately, only about 12% of our customers requested a forbearance. We worked closely with Jeannie May, who was a great partner, and also acted with a sense of urgency. Jeannie May greatly stabilized the marketplace by announcing their pass-through assistance program, otherwise known as PTAP, on May 4th of last year. PTAP was a facility for GMA servicers to fund principal and interest advances for loans impacted by the pandemic and on forbearance. And the PTAP facility, while not utilized widely, was a great signaling event to the institutions who provide us financing that GMA was going to do everything they could to help. And that allowed us to increase our advanced facilities, which provided stability to the industry. And one of the key wins for both Mr. Cooper and the market was our ability to secure long-term advanced financing through an industry-first bilateral advanced and MSR facility for Ginny May Assets. Ginny May's partnership with both Mr. Cooper and our financing partner now allows Mr. Cooper to finance Ginny May advances and reduces liquidity risk for non-banks substantially. We continue to be grateful for Ginny May's support in closing this key transaction and working with servicers to find solutions during the crisis. And then as we strengthen our financial position, it was critical that we also provide education and options to our customers as they recovered economically and were able to resume payments on their mortgages. For customers, this was a confusing time as they received often conflicting information from their family, friends, news channels, and financial institutions. In addition to setting up online digital tools for customers to apply for forbearances, we also built a rich educational library of information for customers to understand the CARES Act and its impact on their mortgage. I personally recorded videos to assure our customers that help was available, and our digital tools and team members were there to help answer their questions. With almost 2 million visits to our educational content in the first 90 days of the pandemic, we really established a mechanism for our customers to get help and engage with us digitally. And we made the process of applying for a forbearance seamless. 
resulting in 65% of our forbearance applications online, while the other 35% were handled by our well-trained agents. On reaching the three-month mark of the pandemic, we opened forbearance extensions and post-forbearance workout solutions to our customers. And today, about 40% of our customers who have exited their forbearances have done so via our digital tools. As difficult as the challenges of this past year, what are the new challenges you expect for the upcoming 12 months? Do you expect most of the existing foreborn borrowers to extend to the last possible date? Is there an avalanche, so to speak, awaiting? Well, I think the real issue is going to be the customers who don't have the means to resume payment, you know, even at a reduced level at the end of their 18 months of forbearance. Our internal forecast assumes vaccinations will be widely administered by the end of the second quarter, and the service industry will begin to normalize again in the third quarter. And while this should reduce unemployment and lead to more homeowners being able to resume making mortgage payments, it also will put upward pressure on interest rates, which reduces the payment savings for loan modifications. We're providing this education to our customers to let them know that they may benefit from today's low rates if they have resumed employment and have the ability to be making payments again. Again, the digital tools we have built out and the automation behind our modifications is going to allow us to handle the avalanche or the potential avalanche that you reference. You know, we feel with that with our automation, we have the scale to handle the volumes we're expecting and the streamlined partial claims and modifications put forth by FHA, so they were really game changers. And our ability to provide modification terms instantaneously and then get the modifications executed, notarized, and fulfilled And by the way, we believe mobile notaries are critical in that effort will allow not only us, but most servicers to handle requests at scales we have never before seen. I actually find the continued articles about how far the mortgage industry is behind on digital tools to be somewhat misleading. The fact that as an industry, we fulfill millions of forbearance plans within weeks of the CARES Act, have provided updated solutions for those customers at the end of their forbearance, and done all of this at the same time as moving our entire staff to work from home speaks volumes to the advanced technology in the mortgage space. Well, it sounds like you're ready for the next 12 months. Any projections about the utilization percent of either a partial claim, modification, or house disposition options? Of our FHA customers that have exited forbearance over the last three months, we're seeing the majority of them take a modification. And then with the bulk of the remainder, opting for the partial claim. And I think this is largely due to the low rate environment and customers' ability to modify their loan into a market rate at the end of the forbearance utilizing FHA's standalone COVID-19 modification. And we expect this trend to hold throughout the remaining term of the pandemic. Home disposition is obviously the last option for a customer, and we feel that the home retention options put in place by FHA, VA, and USDA will minimize our level of short sales, fees in lieu, and foreclosure. However, we do realize that there will be a small percentage of customers who are unable to or unwilling to resume making mortgage payments, and we expect most of these outcomes will occur on loans which were delinquent prior to the pandemic and have little to no equity in their home. I see. FHA recently published Mortgagee Letter 21-05, which is an update to the FHA COVID-19 loss mitigation policy. This update extended the forbearance enrollment, expanded eligible borrowers, and provided two three-month forbearance extensions, which now can total 18 months. What do you think will happen? Well, I applaud that effort. I think you know this is really about giving the country the time to recover economically from the effects of the pandemic. There are a number of customers, particularly FHA customers, who are more often low to moderate income homeowners, and they've been impacted economically by the pandemic, and they're still in pretty bad financial shape. And the great thing about the forbearance plans offered was the pause on the payment that gave these families time to focus on important things like food, clothing, and childcare. And as the impact of the vaccines and medical solutions for COVID continue to emerge. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we think the country is going to recover. And we're already seeing some of that, obviously, in the stock market and the bond market is reflecting that also. I'm confident that the added time up to the 18 months will give more customers the opportunity to get back on their feet, you know, once the economy has more fully reopened. In terms of our expected performance, 
Our models currently anticipate about one in four forbearance plans will extend through the full 18 months. And keep in mind that more than 50% of the forbearance plans that we've started have already resolved. So of the remaining 50%, we think one in four will extend to the 18 months. And so given that, we think that the majority of customers who took forbearance prior to June 30th, 2020, and are still active today, will remain in forbearance for the full 18 months. I imagine there's plenty of heavy lifting required of Ginnie Mae servicers to conduct loss mitigation activities for approximately 1 million households, whether the foreborn borrowers exit as soon as possible or continue to extend. Is not one big challenge for Mr. Cooper the fact that under the CARES Act, it is the borrower who makes all the elections? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, the fact that the customer makes all the elections has certainly been one of our key areas of focus in developing technology you know, for the impact of customers. When customers can choose to extend or repay past due payments, enter into a partial claim, or pursue different types of modifications, and all of these options are available to them at any point, you have to be able to provide extremely flexible tools to help. So, you know, however, at Mr. Cooper, we started working on enhancing our loss mitigation tools in 2018. So, you know, we've, we've invested over time and been planning for, you know, another situation. Certainly could not have predicted this one, but we've been investing in our tools. And it was at a time when mods were low for us. But we did this because we knew there would be, you know, another down cycle. And whether this was a result of a recession, natural disasters, or in this case, a pandemic, we knew that inevitably we would need to ramp up our loss mitigation efforts. And so by creating a tool with flexibility to add various programs, most of the heavy lifting is done automatically. You know, we have found that this is extremely beneficial for our customers who are able to see the key terms of their permanent solutions before they enter into the program, whether a partial claim, which just moves the missed payments to the end of the loan, or a modification which capitalizes past due amounts and then reamortizes the loan at a lower rate over 360 months, the customers can see the post-forbearance loan balance. They can see the monthly P&I and T&I payment, and then they can educate themselves on all aspects of their chosen solution. So FHA revisions with ML 2021-05 provide some additional challenges for significantly delinquent customers, along with customers who never entered into forbearance, However, I think the flexibility of our automated tools should allow us to release these options shortly as well. I'm curious, what are the interactions between Mr. Cooper and the individual foreborn borrower? What does Mr. Cooper know about the foreborn household financial situation, such as income and assistance payments, the employment situation, the employer or the industry of employment? Is this information known during the forbearance period? Or only once loss mitigation is requested by the borrower? Well, at Mr. Cooper, we have a multi-tiered customer outreach, you know, engagement and education program. And that includes phone calls, emails, chat, letters, you know, social media, and personalized videos. And as I mentioned earlier, Mr. Cooper provides our customers with educational content personalized to that customer situation and investor to help them make informed decisions on continuing forbearance and what to expect when they resume their mortgage payments. All of this education is provided within a comprehensive self-service website where the customer can interact 24 seven, initiating forbearance and post forbearance solutions. We also collect optional information about the customer's economic situation at both the start and at the end of the forbearance to help us provide the solution that works best for each customer. And finally, we have leveraged much of the automation we use in our origination process for loss mitigation, allowing customers who need greater payment savings and want to apply for the FHA HAMP mod, for example, which requires income documentation, to upload those documents electronically and instantaneously, which expedites underwriting and decisioning. And fortunately, because the CARES Act allowed for forbearance requests without the customer providing any information about their hardship, we have limited information on the customer beyond what they provide to us voluntarily. However, as a loan servicer, we receive monthly credit bureau information, which includes payment information on auto loans, student loans, credit card accounts, and other debts. And that allows us to assess their payment patterns and revolving debt levels throughout the forbearance period. 
we are incorporating this information into our performance models, but it's still too early to gauge how, me how meaningful this data you know, will be. Our colleagues on the buy side have vivid memories of the high read default rate of modifications conducted during the global financial crisis more than a decade ago. What can you share about the modification process once a borrower either requests loss mitigation or the forbearance expires? How do you determine the loss mitigation option that best fits a borrower? Well, as we think about that, I mean, let, let's focus on FHA, which is where you have the most customers still on forbearance. And starting 45 days before a customer comes to the end of their forbearance period, we are calling them, we're sending them emails, text as permitted, and mailing letters to them to alert them of the end of their plan. And one thing, and I mentioned this earlier, we've started doing recently is sending customized videos, which explain the options the individual customer has available to them to resolve their foreborn payments. And we are seeing modifications, even after capitalizing 12 months of forbearance payments into the modification, resulting in a reduction in monthly PITI payments by 6%. And if you capitalize the escrow shortage, the payment is increased to 12%. And that's just for the standalone modification. So the combination modification partial claim has even higher savings. That's good to know. Are there target metrics that you seek to minimize the recidivism rate of modified borrowers, such as reductions in the note rate or P&I, T&I? We noticed that Mr. Cooper elects modified note rates lower than the FHA rate cap. Are you targeting a threshold or some household buffer? that increases the success of the modification? Obviously, as you know, a customer's payment is going to be critical to reestablishing performance post forbearance. And for most investors, including FHA and the GSEs, the terms of the modifications a servicer is delegated to offer are largely prescriptive. The only variable for both FHA and VA where servicers are given really any discretion is the interest rate offered to the borrower. An interest rate decision is one way we believe the servicer still does play a large role in the outcome for the investors and customers. And we've made a decision to maintain rates below the permitted maximum rates of FHA and VA on our modifications. And we also offer educational tools, as I've mentioned, so that a customer can really understand their outcome and choose a program where they are most likely to succeed. Mr. Cooper grew up in the aftermath of the Great Recession, and we understand loss mitigation. We have a track record of keeping customers in their homes for the long run. And we accomplish this by doing the right thing for the customer. And we believe that providing customers, particularly those impacted by the pandemic, a reduced payment will reduce the level of recidivism. This is good for the customer, it's good for the servicer, and it's good for the investor. It's also likely the reason that we have a higher rate of modifications and lower rate of partial claims than the industry. Additionally, by offering the customer a modification with a market interest rate, you reduce that customer's need to refinance the loan down the road. The refinancing adds incremental costs like title and other fees, along with upfront MIP. And we believe that putting customers who have been impacted most by the pandemic into a market rate is just the right thing to do. And so we are always going to do what is in the best interest of our customers. And we feel this is one of the ways that we can strengthen home ownership and help low to moderate income homeowners maintain the dream of home ownership. Naturally, the buy side is concerned that the same recidivism rate occurs as those of the great financial crises. How do you expect modifications in this era to perform? What do you think the redefault rate within the next 24 months will be? Well, obviously the great financial crisis had a couple of things associated with modification recidivism that don't exist today. It had a preponderance of stated income loans where the customer wasn't able to afford the loan in the first place and a huge drop in property values, creating customers who were unwilling to pay for a property that was worth sometimes as much as 50% less than what was owed. That said, we're not going into the situation with the expectation that 100% of the customers will be paying on their modified loans 24 months after the modification or partial claim. A recent update from Black Knight showed that after capitalizing 18 months of forbearance into the loan balance, a GMA borrower was two and a half times more likely to have less than 10% equity in their property than a Fannie or Freddie Mac borrower. And obviously, we think uh, this will impact recidivism. Our current models, uh, as we're calibrating them today, 
expect a little more than 10% of the loans to redefault in the 24 months after forbearance. And the primary drivers of our model are payments made during forbearance, payment history prior to forbearance, equity in the property, and geographic data. We've been back testing the model with early forbearance exits, but we still don't have enough data points or elapsed time to determine model accuracy. So we still still got a ways to go to determine how they're going to behave ultimately. Understood. Before we end, may we address buyouts? Our buy side stakeholders, the market makers and certificate holders, must deal with the challenges of predicting Ginnie Mae mortgage-backed security prepayments occurring because of massive refinance activity and the potential for buyouts of serious delinquent loans. They're very concerned about the scale of optional buyouts and its effect on the MBS valuations. Could you share with our audience Mr. Cooper's decision protocol to buyouts? What are the business factors that must be addressed before Mr. Cooper allocates capital to an optional transaction? Now, why Mr. Cooper has a lower buyout rate than your peers? That's a great question. Let me start by addressing the last question first. At Mr. Cooper, we run our entire portfolio through our risk models to ensure that we are buying out the loans that have the best chance of reperformance. In addition, since we are not a bank, you know, with endless capital to allocate to holding loans on our balance sheet for an indefinite period of time, we take these factors very seriously to ensure that we are able to redeliver the loans in a timely manner to maximize the usage of our capital loans. And that said, while we may continue to have lower rates than our peers, I do think we will be more active buying out loans now that we further assess the risk and the returns. We also know that we will be an active issuer of new Ginnie Mae securities and we want to ensure that we are providing value to investors in our GMA pools. We do compare our ongoing performance on speeds and delinquencies to our peers, and that comparison guides our strategy. What risk does Mr. Cooper attribute to Ginnie Mae's recent APM 20-07, which restricts repooling of optional buyouts to the specific custom pool type? Yeah, you know, this is a really important issue for servicers, and I think particularly for non-depositories. APM 20-07 and the more clarifying APM 20-15 put significant restrictions on issuers regarding re-performing loans and created cost and risk for a servicer looking to buy out loans and forbearance. It is important to note that the cost associated with the pandemic and servicing these customers has risen materially for servicers. And we were faced with the technology costs, which we've covered, as well as increased staffing costs and significant compliance-related expenses. This, in addition to third-party costs for notarization and recording of FHA and VA loss mitigation solutions, along with the carry cost of making advances during the forbearance. FHA has also not provided servicer incentives or cost reimbursements for their COVID loss mitigation solutions. One way of recouping some of these costs is through buyout and redelivery of 90 plus delinquent loans and forbearance. And APM 20-07 has added cost and risk to GMA servicers and it's gonna increase the cost of service. The seasoning requirements for C-RG pools require timely payments for six months or at least 210 days has passed from the last date of delinquency. This adds you know, significant risk around re-performance. And you know, for banks, you know, they can finance these loans on their balance sheet with deposits. But for non-depositories, we're relying on financing vehicles with increasing haircuts or lower advance rates as loans age on the lines. Uh, another point is the seasoning requirements prohibit our ability to immediately pool borrowers that choose to repay their foreborn amounts and become reinstated as current immediately, increasing our carrying costs. And this may result in an increased frequency of loan modifications, which are not subject to APM's 20-07 and 20-15 seasoning requirements. Last point I'd say is increased cost of servicing ultimately hurts the borrower as it increases their mortgage rate and financing costs and can potentially impact their ability to qualify for a loan. While these APMs are probably acceptable, very low rate environment, as rates increase, unilateral changes that impact the obligations of issuers may eliminate you know, viable and willing GMA servicers and ultimately decrease liquidity for the FHA, VA, and USDA products that promote home ownership in the United States. I understand the risk, the scale of a delinquency portfolio, uncertainty of duration to employment recovery, continuation of the Fed buy program, and direction of interest rates all create a challenge to navigate through the crisis. 
and hopefully collective actions achieve a soft landing for all stakeholders, issuers, borrowers, insuring agencies, Ginny May, and MBS investors. Given this scale and complexity of this delinquent population, has many uncertainties. Does Mr. Cooper have capacity constraints? For example, is there a maximum amount of mandatory and optional buyouts you can facilitate monthly? Also, what do you see as the cadence for Mr. Cooper and your buyouts going forward? Well, we've been able to secure significant financing capacity for EBOs through our bank partners, many of which already financed buyout product prior to COVID. And banks have invested time in understanding the product and have provided capacity to grow you know, with our increased demand. And we've thoughtfully sized our lines based on expected volume and can upsize if the demand increases through the year. Also, our financing banks have maintained and even improved their leverage, their increased advance rates on EBOs, resulting in a very low capital requirement as buyout volumes increase. So we're working with the largest banks in the street, uh, but we're seeing appetite you know, across the spectrum, with not only the large banks and medium and smaller banks as well. And then away from traditional financing through banks, we expect capital market an asset sell transaction will remain an outlet in the market for issuers. While we don't view these as a necessary part of our strategy, we believe they will offer further liquidity in the market for the buyout pipeline. And our buyout cadence is largely going to be driven by our customers' ability to exit forbearance plans. You know, we first and foremost want to do the right thing for our customers and offer them a smooth transition out of forbearance, as we've discussed. And so as such, you know, we buy loans out throughout the month and expect to continue to do so. And we have longstanding operational expertise in the buyout process and are well set to handle the increased volumes we expect in the coming months. Jay, this has been very informative. You have certainly provided insight into Mr. Cooper's default management experience, significant investments in technology, funding lines, and staffing, and most importantly, your practices of conducting successful loss mitigation strategies. Thank you for your time and for sharing these invaluable insights. Well, thank you, John. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to share what's going on at Mr. Cooper and how we're helping our customers. And I would just say thank you to you uh, and Jenny May for being you know, a strong partner through all of this. I've really stayed focused on you know, helping customers and issuers as well. So great to spend time together. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jay. That was Jay Bray, Chairman and CEO of Mr. Cooper. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to future episodes of Capital Markets Live on YouTube. If you have any comments or questions about today's episode or other topics, please send us an email to OCM Global Investor Inquiry at HUD.gov. Again, thanks for listening and stay healthy.